Thanks for that introduction, Richard. That was very, very generous. And thank you, everybody, for turning up this evening, for giving me an hour or so of your time to, uh, to listen to me talk about a subject that is close to my heart. Um, I, I've always had a visceral kind of negative reaction <laughs> to the idea of masks. So I'll, I'll say from the outset that I cannot claim 100% impartiality about this topic. Uh, not, that, not that anybody can ever claim 100% impartiality. But I will try and be as rational and evidence-based as possible in some of my arguments. Um, back in 2020, certainly the first half of it, we witnessed the must be the biggest U-turn in public health history, in my opinion. Because in a matter of just a few weeks, we went from a situation where all the experts were telling us healthy people in the community don't wear masks, they're ineffectual, and you know, they're likely to, be, to do more harm than good. You know, almost to a man and woman, the experts were saying that. And then in a space of probably about four or five weeks, it flipped. The reverse ferret onto one where they were mandating the damn things. <laughs> yeah. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is it's a personal perspective and I'll be really keen to hear your views at the end of it. And you may, by all means, and no doubt you will challenge me on some aspects of it. That's fine. Um, but what I'll give is my personal perspective after doing a lot and lot of research and digging into this, reading lots of documents, trying to find out who did what, when, wading through minutes of meetings, etc., uh, to try and uncover who were the individuals responsible for that flip-flop. You know, who holds the, the most kind of culpability for that? And as the name of, of this talk conveys, I personally pin it on one particular group as being the ones implicated more than any other. And it'd be interesting to see whether you agree with me after I've gone through this. Um, okay, so the cutting plan for this evening uh, is I'm going to try and break it into these six parts. Most of it is kind of a, a chronological kind of step by step through two 2020, the first six months of. Um, I'll first of all talk about what, a period of sanity. This is what I've just mentioned, where all the experts were telling us masks do not achieve any appreciable benefits with viral infections and probably do more harm than good. I'll remind you of some of the things that key people said uh, during that period which I've got as February to early April-ish, yeah. I'll then deviate from the story a little bit as far as the timeline's concerned by just talking about evidence for mask efficacy or inefficacy, as the case may be. I'll then get back on track with the timeline with what I've called a, a lukewarm phase which I think is a fas fascinating uh, period, 7th to about the 20th of April, um, where the people in power, in the, like the SAGE committees, were probing the academic landscape, almost it would appear looking for some evidence to push mass on healthy people. Uh, but at that time, they weren't very successful. Very interesting, I, I think, how some of the expert groups responded during that period. But then, unfortunately, in my opinion, we had the flip-flop, the reverse ferret, uh, which was from about 21st of April 2020 to early June, um, when it was totally turned upon its head. And we went from, no, these things do not do any real good uh, and may do some harm and we flipped into you must wear a mask in these situations 
or you will be fined. And at the risk of bringing back bad memories, you remember that the, the mandates started around about mid-June 2020. 15th of June it was in England uh, for the transport kind of mandate, where we know on buses, etc. And it's slightly different in Scotland, but I think broadly the same time, it's got to uh, mid-June through to July. So starting with transport, then we had health, I think, and uh, the pubs and other community services, and then ultimately uh, in education, which I don't know about you, but seeing kids masked up in a classroom is one of the most, uh, I don't know, obscene images that still lingers with me uh, from the COVID event. And then I'll just tie it up at the end with some of my personal conclusions, which, like I said, you may or may not agree with, but I'll be interested in your opinion. Does that sound okay? <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, it's, it's nice to be back in Edinburgh, by the way. In sunny Edinburgh, I've got it. was sunshiny this afternoon. I didn't expect that. So that was a very, a very good start. Okay. Let's look at the period of sanity in the world as well as the UK um, when masking people in the community was seen as not the thing to do. It was never in any pandemic plan to mask healthy people in the community settings. Um, you know, despite what some of the so-called experts might say, we did, we, we did have carefully prepared pandemic plans and in those plans there was no mention of, of masking healthy people in community settings. And these quotes really, I'll just quickly go through these just to give you a flavour of what the expert opinion was uh, back at this time, which was February through to uh, early April. So of course we had the US doctor, Anthony Fauci, um, in an email said, I quote, the typical mask you buy in the drugstore is not really effective in keeping out virus which is small enough to pass through material. I've often described it, as have others, as a bit like trying to catch sand in a tennis net. You know, they all, <laughs> viruses are so kind of minute, you know, it's there's a bit of cloth across your face or even plastic, it's not going to do the business, particularly with the big gaps around the side. Our very own Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Chris Whitty, said back on the 4th of March 2020, he said this in his usual very uh, direct and concise way, uh, in terms of wearing a mask, our advice is clear that wearing a mask, if you don't have an infection, reduces the risk almost not at all. So we do not advise that. So I interpret that as being don't wear them. Yeah. This third bit of evidence, I was talking to Karen earlier, so I'm, I may be being a bit England-centric here, because this may not be the case in Scotland. I don't know, I'll have to check this. But certainly, in, I've had it from some senior union reps in England who've been fighting mass cases, that in, in England at least, um, sorry, just hold on to that, I'll rewind. I didn't, yeah, come to that in a bit. Uh, UK advertising agency actually banned two adverts back in the early March 2020. So two companies who were saying, our mask protects against coronavirus, the UK Advertising Standards Agency stepped in and actually banned that commercial and kind of uh, censored the companies for pushing that. And during the rigmarole that that caused, um, the, the uh, Public Health England apparently had told the advertising agency, and I quote, we do not recommend the use of face masks as a means of protection from coronavirus. And at the same time, Stephen Powis, who was then the NHS medical director, said, and I quote, callous firms looking to maximise profits by pushing products that fly in the face of official advice is outright dangerous and has rightly been banned. Those was his words. That was 4th of March 2020. 
So again, we don't, you can't get more emphatic than that. You know, these, these, these guys and girls were absolutely you know, 100% on how useful or not masks were. Fauci again told a TV show back in 8th of March 20, there's no reason to be walking around with a mask and often there are unintended consequences. People keep fiddling with the mask and they keep touching their face. I think we can all kind of confirm that just from our everyday observations during the period when most people were wearing one. Uh, Jenny Iris, the, who was then the England uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, she's now the head of the UK Health Security Agency, she told Boris Johnson in an interview that wearing masks was not a good idea and could increase risk of infection. You can actually trap the virus in the mask and start breathing it in. The World Health Organization, 26th of March to 20, tweeted, if you do not have any respiratory symptoms, you do not need to wear a medical mask. When used alone, masks can give you a false feeling of protection and can even be a source of infection when not used correctly. I'll quickly go through some of the others. The inimitable Jonathan Van Tam, who was the England's deputy chief medical officer at that time, in a TV briefing said, we do not recommend face masks for general wearing. On the same day, nearer to here, uh, Jason Leach, the Scottish clinical director, said, the global evidence is masks in the general population don't work. And the World Health Organization's new guidance that was published on the 6th of April 2020 stated, the wide use of masks by healthy people in the community is not supported by current evidence and carries uncertainties and critical risks. So for me, this was a period of sanity. This, 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 was, this was rational. This was, this was in keeping. Um, and it was based on the evidence that was around and available in early 2020. Uh, so this period of sanity. And I'll just deviate away from the timeline for a, a five or ten minutes, just to... Sorry, I didn't move that along, did I? I beg your pardon. Uh, evidence remask in efficacy. I just want to just go through some of the published uh, papers of the time. Um, I can't claim this is 100% you know, all-inclusive because there's obviously lots of studies around, uh, but it gives you a flavour of the evidence base. In my attempt to be impartial, despite my visceral negative reaction to masks, I've included a couple of studies in this that actually were pro-mask, that were pushing them. Okay, and I appreciate it's a polarising subject, one of the most divisive, perhaps, uh, and, and I think one of the most insidious of all the restrictions. But, uh, that might just be, just be me. But looking back, the Cochrane reviews, remember these are the gold standard uh, reviews, always for many years when I worked in the health service, these were always thought to be the gold standard. You know, if the Cochrane Review said something or found something, you know, pretty much gospel. That was, that was really reliable. Now, they produced reviews in 2009, 2010 and 2011 that included efficacy of masks. And in not one of those three reviews did Cochrane ever uh, recommend the use of cloth as surgical masks in the community. So that was on record. Um, an interesting little snippet from Canada, which I picked up on a few months back, like the Ontario Nurses Association, who back in 2015 and 2018 won two legal cases uh, against masking nurses at work. And they were being told they had to wear a mask because of the risk of influenza. So another respiratory virus, of course. And, and the arbitrator in that case ruled that the hospital masking policy was, and I quote, illogical and makes no sense. The exact opposite of being reasonable, unquote. And it went on to say that the hospital evidence in support of masking was, and I quote, 
insufficient, inadequate, and completely unpersuasive. <laughs> no, so I, I think that was pretty emphatic uh, back in 2015, 2018. If you look in the at the period just before the mass mandates were brought in to the UK, which as we know was June 2020, if you look at the few weeks before that, I think it's fair to say that the most robust piece of evidence that was published around that time was this uh, third one, which was the review of the randomised controlled trials, 14 randomised controlled trials for influenza. And their conclusion, as written there, is it did not support a substantial effect on transmission of laboratory-confirmed influenza. So there are no significant reduction in risk of infection for neither the wearer or other people. And that's, I'm sure you're aware, is an important distinction because a lot of the pro-mask people often revert to saying, OK, you know, the mask might not protect you, the individual, but it's keeping other people safe. Yeah, it's protecting others. And I still can't get that advert out of my mind. I know it was in England. I don't know if it was in Scotland. I assume so. The one that, where the actor says, I wear my mask to protect my mates. Yeah. You know, what a virtuous, lovely person. Yeah. Um, now, a pro-mask paper, probably the most influential pro-mask paper was this next one, the Lancet Review in June 2020, which I don't think the, the timing of that was coincidental either, <laughs> uh, which, con contrary to all the other evidence accumulated over you know, the previous years, or the more robust evidence at least, this June Lancet Review claimed that medical quality masks could achieve large reductions in infections and here, of course, I've got to try and maintain some degree of impartiality, maybe. But um, I think I wouldn't be alone in saying that this study had lots of major flaws. For one thing, it seemed to ignore completely all the randomised controlled trials and a lot of the real-world evidence. Uh, so generally poor methodology. They focused on hospital transmission rather than in the community. Even worse, they focused just on laboratory kind of findings rather than real world findings. So using mannequins and, you know, firing particles through bits of cloth and all that kind of malarkey. There was kind of a reliance on, on, on that. And there was also a fair bit of cherry picking as well, because they did cite some real world kind of observations claiming that you know, in other parts of the world where mask mandates had been imposed, what followed was a significant reduction in infections. What they failed to mention, of course, was there were at least as many that went the other way, that they actually looked at when the timing of mandates uh, in the aftermath, often infections rose. And I think uh, if you haven't read the Ian Miller book called Unmasked, it's worth reading because he's very detailed, he covers all the states of the US, covers pretty much every country in the world, <laughs> certainly plenty of them, uh, and looks very meticulously at you know, when were mandates introduced and what happened to respiratory virus infections. And the overarching conclusion was there's no relationship at all. In fact, there's probably, you know, if, you count, if you're doing a kind of head count of these different countries and states, more went the opposite way after a mandate than the other way. Um, so it, the Lancet review was probably one of the most cited reviews because it, obviously the, the mainstream media loved it. <laughs> so they were all over it, they pushed it, it got a lot of uh, views on social media. But I think I'm not being too partial by saying it was fundamentally flawed. Okay. Now, since that time, let's move on. Yeah, just to mention a few more studies. So this is going you know, in, in the aftermath of the mask mandates being imposed in the UK. We had the famous Danish mask study published in November 2020, 
that concluded that there was no significant benefit of masks for the wearer. They didn't investigate everybody else, but they were very, very kind of clear that there's no benefit for the wearer. And I don't know whether you can remember this, but this was a much anticipated uh, review because it was the first one that had actually looked at the virus for COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The first one that, that was focused on did mass protect against that. The previous ones have been about respiratory viruses in general, but this was very specific about, uh, about uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and it also important because it used appropriately fitted, high quality surgical masks. In fact, I'd, I don't think I'd be being too unkind to say I think the authors expected and probably hoped for a, a positive result from this when they actually did the investigation. Uh, but what they found was the, the converse. It, did, you know, it, didn't, it didn't bring about any benefit for the wearer. Intriguingly, the publication of this study was delayed quite substantially. It had been ready to go several months before, apparently. Uh, and for some reason, not quite sure what, but for some reason, uh, it wasn't published. At least three academic journals refused it. You think, I oh, refused? You know, this, <laughs> this first randomised controlled trial, you know, the gold standard for, for COVID, first published, you know, the first study, and three academic journals refuse it. What's going on there? I'll let you decide on that one. November 2020, we had uh, a co another Cochrane review, which found again, mass achieved, no appreciable reduction in transmission. Uh, but again, this was a study that was delayed. You know, we actually, I don't know whether you, anyone's ever listened to Tom Jefferson, the, one of the lead, <laughs> the lead uh, authors of these Cochrane reports. Uh, he was not best pleased because he said this result, this Cochrane Review's results were ready to go uh, several months earlier. Uh, but, and to use Tom Jefferson's words, because of some unexplained editorial decisions, <laughs> uh, it was delayed till November, by which time, of course, the mandates, the policies had been set and it was of much less consequence than it might have been if it had appeared in April. Another famous study is the Bangladesh study, which a lot of the pro-mask people claim lends support to masks being effective because one of the headline results was that uh, this study, the Bangladesh study, actually achieved a significant improvement in, 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 uh, in infections, as in a significant reduction. Uh, but the difference was very small and just about reached statistical significance. And you could question whether that had any clinical significance or not. Um, but after saying that even, uh, the results were reanalyzed by Professor Norman Fenton, who I'm sure some of you have heard of, who's one of the leading experts in st statistics. He reanalyzed the results and didn't find any significant difference between the mass group and the unmasked group. But there's another criticism of that of the Bangladesh study as well, which I think is valid, and that and that is that it wasn't looking specifically at masks. Masks was one component but it was a public health education uh, input, which included a lot of advice and guidance for how to manage pandemics. It's just that one group got masks as well, you know, whereas the other group didn't. So I'd argue that, well, the other group didn't get anything. So one, so one group got the education on pandemics, including wear a mask. The other group didn't get anything. Um, so if that difference, and it's a big if, if that difference between the two groups was real, I'd suggest it's probably more likely to be because of something else, such as, I don't know, people staying at home when they were symptomatic and ill, for instance. But do remember, this is rural Bangladesh. 
you know, I'm assuming that their level of, of uh, awareness of pandemic management or illness management policies like that would be quite limited. Um, so that's the Bangladesh uh, study. Still on mask inefficacy. Yeah, there's been lots of systematic evidence reviews. This is where you know, they, they, somebody takes a look at all the different studies that have been done, takes a look at the big picture and comes to some overall conclusion. There's been quite a few of those. A couple of them are mentioned here. One's by the Swiss Policy Research and one by the Cato Institute. There's been others. I think the Brownstone Institute did one as well, and others have. And they all find the same thing. They all come to the same overall conclusion. Masks do not achieve any appreciable benefit when worn by healthy people in the community. And to come almost fully up to date, January 2023, Cochrane Review, uh, the latest one, again found wearing masks are no effect on influenza or on SARS-CoV-2 outcomes. It's all pretty clear. I put Ashley Croft on here because you know, I read his actually watched him when giving evidence to the COVID inquiry and, and went, went through his transcript. Very, very impressive. I don't, <laughs> we could do a few more like that in England, I think. Uh, but he told the Scottish COVID inquiry that back in 2020, there was insufficient evidence to support masks use. And then he went on to say something like, and now even more evidence has accumulated to support that conclusion. And even the UK Health Security Agency's own review of the evidence, which I think was quite recent, September uh, 23. They even described that the evidence that masks uh, achieve any benefit is very weak. So, you know, <laughs> even the UK Health Security Agency, you know, even, even they seem to recognise this. Okay, so the bulk of the more robust evidence, the RCT, the randomised controlled trials, the real, real world studies, conclude that masks achieve no appreciable reduction. Uh, and also something I think that also that's very important is that you know if we if we if we are living in a liberal democracy, if we are living in a civilised society, and the state wants to mandate something, particularly sticking cloth over your airways or plastic over your airways the evidential bar must be set really very high to justify that i'm sure alan would agree from a public health perspective you know if you're gonna if you're gonna mandate something you know you've got to be very sure unequivocal really evidence that whatever you you mandating is going to bring a lot of meaningful benefit to a lot of people and also you've got to be sure that there's no unforeseen negative consequences of the intervention as well just like the original precautionary principle as it once as it once was and i'd suggest that mass mandates failed on both counts with that I'm not going to talk much about the harms that's another talk but uh, they are considerable so clearly, back at that time, up until early April, mass masking requirements were not really being considered at, you know, at that time. So what happened next? What was the next stage? Well, this is the lukewarm phase, which I find quite fascinating, this, this bit. During this time, SAGE started to undertake a period of information gathering, probing the academic landscape in a way, and perhaps I'm being a bit cynical, but apparently searching for some justification for masking the general population. Um, no, I don't know why. We can speculate two weeks into the first lockdown, maybe under pressure from some of the hysterical media screaming, we must do more, we must do more, um, must do something. 
yeah, whatever it was, it did appear that Sage started to seek some affirmation for a, a broader mask policy, let's say. However, the expert feedback they got at this stage was pretty lukewarm, surprisingly so in some respects, looking at who they were asking. So, for example, a multidisciplinary group called Uncover, which some of you may be familiar with because I believe it's based at Edinburgh University, multidisciplinary group of experts um, were asked to do a literature review about, about masks. And their conclusion was, as stated here, wearing face masks in the community was not significantly associated with a reduction in episodes of influenza-like illness. So that was their response. Um, this was like a, what, they, what they call it a rapid, a, a rapid evidence review as requested by SAGE, as requested on behalf of the government. On the same day, the 7th of April, if you actually look at the SAGE minutes, which are there online, you can actually read them, 7th of April, SAGE actually cite the conclusion of Nerve Tag, which is another expert multidisciplinary group. Um, they all have acronyms, these things. It's very confusing. Apparently, Nerve Tag is New and Emerging Respiratory Virus Threats Advisory Group. <laughs> I'll test you whether you remember that later. Yeah, because I don't. I, in fact, I've forgotten what uncover is. That's another acronym. I know the V is viral and E is, is uh, epidemic, I think. Uh, no, it can't be. I, v is definitely viral, but I don't know what the rest of the uncover acronym is about. But it'd be something, sim something similar. Um, but in the SAGE minutes of the 7th of April, SAGE actually cite the conclusions of this other expert group, Nerve Tag. And this was apparently Nerve Tag's conclusion that increased use of masks would have minimal effect in terms of preventing the uninfected general population from becoming infected. So they asked two expert groups there and got two very kind of lukewarm at best responses. Certainly no uh, advice to you know, implement some kind of... Uh, mandate or to, to extend masking in the community yeah now this to me was a key time 7th of april because if, if i if i may ask you to do something now i'd just like to do a bit of a thought experiment i'd like you to imagine that you were actually a core member of the sage advisory committee you're an expert yeah I, some of the some of you here today i know are academic expert you're on the SAGE committee, you've been on pretty much regular attending the SAGE committee since the outset. You know your stuff, you've been following what's been going on. Well, picture it, picture you sat, sat there, although you probably would have been on Zoom back in that, in that time, <laughs> but you participated, well you would when you were back in April, but you, you participated in, in previous groups and you'd done your homework, or oh, you knew that the evidence from masking healthy people in the community wasn't there. That's why it was never in any of the pandemic plans. You'd, you know, you'd be aware of that. You'd also be aware that your scientific leaders in SAGE and in other places had, as we showed in the same phase, had come out with explicit comments that masks for healthy people in the community don't work. So you'd be aware of the historical evidence You'd have been aware of what your scientific leaders would be, would be saying. And now you'd also be aware, because you're in the group, that SAGE have asked two multidisciplinary groups of experts, basically, you know, is there any evidence for masking more generally? And each of those groups of experts had kind of gone, well, no, not really. You know, <laughs> not really going to make that much difference. You know, you know. Now, if you were sat in that group, you know, it's that SAGE committee, that advisory group, what would you expect to happen at that point in time? In a rational world, what would you expect to happen? Now, for me, and I might be living in a little bubble, I don't know. For me, I think it would have been rational to have said, I think we've probably done enough probing here. 
You know, masks, masks really don't work. Mask, masking healthy people in the community. We're not onto something here. Let's spend our time looking at something else that might be of benefit to the people. And I could be wrong, you know, if I was sat on that committee, which I wasn't incidentally, but if I was sat on that, on that committee, maybe I'd have kept quiet as well. But I, I would have liked to think I'd stick me. I'd go, whoa, you know, wh why are we still wasting time on this? You know, why? Yeah, we'll talk about that at the end. But uh, remember, that was 7th of April when they got those publications who talked about Uncover and talked about uh, Nerve Tag um, both coming up with these they don't really help conclusions but what did Sage do? Like I said in a rational world they would have you know, given up I think there wouldn't they? They would have said no no we're not going to do that anymore let's go and look at something else because we're on a dead end but not on your Nelly. No, not at all. Two days later, two days, this, in the Sage Minutes, they'd actually requested Nerve Tag to do another damn review. Another paper on mass. But this time, including any behavioural aspects associated with them, drawing on SPIB as necessary. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the behavioural science terrain, what, 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 what they're getting at here is masks very strongly reinforce nudges. Now, just going back even further, behavioural science nudges, these are strategies of persuasion, psychological methods of persuasion that often act on their targets below people's level of awareness. Yeah. In fact, what they, what they do is they, they exploit the fact that human beings spend 99.9% .9 of the time in automatic pilot. You know, we don't really deliberate over the vast majority of our decisions. We have like, they call it like, the way, we have a fast brain and a slow brain. The fast brain is the automatic one that dominates. It's got infinite capacity, it's effortless. Uh, and it's usually right, to be fair. You know, we make instant decisions every moment of our life without thinking about it and it's usually correct you know if I'm leaving this building tonight and there's 300 people screaming shouting and all running in the same direction I'll probably find myself running with them without even thinking about it it'll be made automatic and it'll probably be sensible because there might be something nasty coming up the road but what the behavioural scientists have done, and I don't want to digress too far, because as I'm sure you can tell, this is a subject I'm passionate about. What they've done is they've exploited that and used a range of nudges to influence people's behaviour. And three of these many nudges, three of them are fear inflation, because when we're frightened, we tend to think about things in a different way. We see threats where there aren't any. We have easy access to threatening things from the past. We interpret things in a, in a, in a, in a threatening way in the present. So it's fear inflation, shaming, which they, in their academic language, call the ego nudge, which is equating following the restrictions with being a good, virtuous person. And peer pressure which can very easily slip over into scapegoating, which the behavioural scientists call normative pressure, norms, the norm nudge. So that's just really just give you a very quick and simplistic explanation of what, what, they're, what they're alluding to here in SAGE with this, including any behavioural aspects associated with them drawing on SPIB as necessary. So yeah, you know, I think I can be forgiven for thinking that Sage here have not been hearing what they want to hear and they've not given up. They're still probing that academic landscape. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, they're now asking Nerve Tag again to do a review and the SPIB, which as I said is the subgroup of Sage, which is the behavioural science subgroup for the communications. And if you had to pick two groups, really, who, who may favour mass, you know, you probably would pick those two. A nerve tag uh, 
you know, had amongst it men membership people like uh, uh, Professor Neil Ferguson, uh, Malcolm Semple, John Edmonds. You know, these were hardly sceptics. These were quite pro-lockdown individuals. I think that's fair to say. And obviously, SPIB, you know, they would inevitably see the attraction of masks because masks reinforce each one of those three nudges. They perpetuate fear. They give people a very simple way of demonstrating virtue. And they harness normative pressure very, very effectively. I'm sure I'm not alone in sitting in a room like this and being the only person without a mask in a room full of masked people. Not a comfortable place to be. You can, you know, it's palpable, isn't it? So they've <laughs> no, not done the rational thing and said, let's hang up our boots here. You know, <laughs> let's, let's not keep going down this line of looking at masks. You know, let's look at something else more useful. They haven't done that. They've asked these two groups to produce further papers. But again, really interesting thing is that both these groups, again, did not recommend masking healthy people in the community. Uh, the nerve tag paper came out on the 13th of April uh, and their conclusion was overall there's insufficient evidence to recommend universal use of face masks in the community. Okay, the um and about some you know, peripheral issues, but that was the central message. And they were very adamant about policy implications. They actually said, and I quote, universal face masks in the community and in block capitals not recommended. Face masks for all for short periods of unavoidable close contact, they're described as permissive. Which I had to look that up in the dictionary in this context. <laughs> permissive. What does it mean there? Permissive. Okay, that's a, for me that means it's up to the individual. Don't know. That was that seemed to be what they were what they were getting at. As we will see. Even SPIB, who I've criticised a lot recently, I must admit, over the last few months, and continue to do so. But give them credit, even, and I'll come to the SPIB paper in a sec, but even the SPIB were lukewarm about mass mandates at this point. But what did SAGE do? 16th of April, in their minutes, they echoed Nerve Tag's conclusion that insufficient evidence to recommend universal masking, but then commit, and this is, you know, this is almost unbelievable really, then commit to providing revised mask guidance by April the 20th. Now, perhaps I'm missing something. You know, they've, they've had all this, you know, they've been poking the academic landscape, looking for papers, evidence, and all much, pretty much, without exception, saying, don't do it. And yet, here they are on the 16th of April, announcing that they're going to provide revised mass guidance on April the 20th. And there was even in the minutes an action for Chris uh, Whitty, the, the chief medical officer, to produce a summary of recommendations on wearing face masks, drawing on evidence synthesis from Delve. <laughs> now, who the, no, Delve was my first reaction, excuse me, I almost swore there. But who, you know, Delve, I'd never heard of them. Uh, I, you heard of them? No, no, neither, neither had I. Again, it's an acronym. I don't remember what, what it is, but uh, V will be viral and <laughs> whatever. Uh, I've never heard of Del Delve. Yet, after all this, Sage are announcing that they're going to change the mask rules. And this was the first mention of what I've called the shadowy group, because I think Delve were the deal clinches. I think if Delve hadn't have been there, my personal view is that none of us would have had to endure the mass mandates. And I'll see whether you agree with me by the end of our, our discussion. Um, and all I can imagine is that the sage minutes of the 16th of the 4th there, at that point, very clearly something had happened behind the scenes. They could see the 
the Sage Cavalry coming over the horizon, the pro mass cavalry. Uh, hence, that's what they said about they were going to revise the guidance by April the 20th. Now, this PIB paper that I mentioned, like I said, credit where credit's due, that still remained pretty lukewarm about masking. Surprisingly, there was no strong endorsement of community masking. They highlighted the potential uh, benefits and the negative outcomes of recommending masks in the community. As expected, for the reasons I've mentioned, they did promote face coverings as a, a way to demonstrate that an individual is concerned about other people, ego nudge, and is enacting desired social norms, normative pressure. Yeah, they recognised that, they thought that was a positive. Um, but they also drew attention to some of the downsides, the undesirable implications of mass mandates, about negative evaluation and harassment of people who are not wearing face masks, leading to division which would undermine collective solidarity. In that paper, the SBIB also raised the issue of the, you know, well, what, and what would be our exit strategy? Which I think is a really good point. You know, you're bringing in mass mandates at that point in time. What would be the criteria for stopping them? You know, what would be the exit strategy? What would you, you know, when, when would you actually get out of this practice? So anyway, the flip-flop was imminent. And on the 21st of April 2020, Delve produced its very influential, pivotal, I would say, paper titled Report on Face Masks for the General Public. Well, Delve, by the way, I've got it written here. Data Evaluation and Learning for Viral Epidemics. That's, that's Delve. It's an initiative that's hosted and convened by the Royal Society. <laughs> Richard Grimaces, I can, I'm with him. Uh, who's the, I think I'm it's true to say, the long, longest standing scientific institute in the UK. Uh, and according to its website, and I quote, dedicated to promoting excellence in science for the benefit of humanity. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so obviously there's a close connection between Delve and the Royal Society probably no surprise there in retrospect and this paper was just radically different from anything else that had come before but the first line, the very first line is there face masks offer an important tool for managing forward transmission of COVID-19 within the general population you know, compare that to what Nerve tag was saying, or uncover, or all the other kind of reviews and evidence uh, evaluations. I won't go into the paper. If, if you want to read, if you want to read it, you can. But it, but let's let's just say it was fundamentally flawed. It cited very selected laboratory and observational studies, like we talked about before, cherry picking. Uh, there was no consideration of, of randomised controlled trials. There was no uh, consideration of the more robust real-world evidence. They tend to focus on uh, laboratory and observational studies. There was a gross overestimate in that paper, I would I believe, of asymptomatic transmission. For those who are not familiar with that term, asymptomatic, asymptomatic transmission is the idea that healthy People who don't have symptoms pass on infection to others. And was one of the big cornerstones that fueled the pro-mask uh, kind of uh, crusade. Because, you know, even though you're not coughing, coughing and spluttering, and you look perfectly healthy, you could still be infecting me. Yeah, so we need to mask everybody. I think it's probably a bit simplified, but I think that, that catches the gist. Uh, I'm not saying there wasn't any kind of... Uh, infection transmission by symptomless people. I think there is. I think the evidence suggests that pre-symptomatic people, people who are two or three days away from becoming, becoming ill, can pass, on, uh, can pass on illness. But it's a relatively small contribution to the overall kind of uh, 
push towards infecting everybody. And one study estimated that it was probably around 7% contribution to perpetuating a pandemic. But according to this Delve paper, I think they've got the figures, I think I'm in the right ballpark, they claim 80% of, of infections were transmitted asymptomatically, which I think was sort of nonsense. Uh, and there's also a corruption of the precautionary principle. So again, it's a session on its own, isn't it? The precautionary principle, the original precautionary principle, the sensible precautionary principle, which dates back to the 70s, I think, around the pollution agenda, uh, basically stated that if you're going to bring into society a, a, an innovation, a new way of doing things, a new intervention, you've got to reassure us and show some evidence for that you know, and reassure us that there's not going to be significant side effects, not going to be significant collateral damage, not going to be significant negative, negative consequences. And of course, that's been corrupted uh, over more recent times towards a more gung-ho kind of, uh, oh, let's not let worries about collateral damage kind of stifle innovation. <laughs> you know, they've kind of turned that on its, on its head, but there's probably another session on that because I won't get into it, but it's, a, it's an interesting one. But this paper, the Dell's paper, corrupted the precautionary principle. And we're doing, well, I better start winding down a bit. Uh, and they actually said, which sounds absurd to me, but widespread use of surgical and homemade face masks among the public can have a significant mitigating effect on the spread of COVID-19. Yeah. So for me, this was a key moment, this paper. You know, this was stridently pro mass from a group of you know, respected academics. I'll come to the membership in a, in a moment. Uh, uh, and predictably, although somewhat depressingly, this triggered a pro mask pile on. They all came out of the woodwork <laughs> at this point. Yeah. So in the aftermath of the Delve paper, what did we get? The London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine published a computer modelling paper. Uh, what can go wrong there? Eh? Computer modelling uh, that showed that masks could achieve a modest impact on viral transmission. Obviously, Sage, you know, the Sage fellows and ladies, they, they'd got what they wanted. You know, they were then saying on the 21st of April, there is enough evidence to support recommendation of community use of cloth face masks. Goodness gracious, even the, even the pro mask people you know, pretty much admit that cloth masks were useless. <laughs> you know? uh, so Sage didn't waste any time in adopting a pro mask stance. Then the British Medical Association, the BMA, waded in with a press release on the 25th of April, said all key workers must get masks and public should cover their faces. Uh, the Royal Society then republished the Delve paper on its own website. So we're still on the pile on here. Patrick Valance, Valance the Chief Scientific Officer and co-chair of SAGE committee, uh, was then telling MPs that masks could have a marginal but positive impact. Uh, and then the World Health Organization changed its uh, advice uh, on the 5th of June and now advises to the public to wear face masks. Now, interestingly, the, with the WHO, Deb Cohen, who was then a, a BBC Newsnight science reporter, uh, did publish something very interesting around that time. Uh, what she said, and I quote her, although I noticed she's deleted this off the social media, but that, uh, what's it called, that website that, that, uh, where, you, where you can look at things that have been taken down? The back, that's the one, yeah. If you go on there, you can find it. Yeah. Uh, and she said, the, the debate is deeply political. Newsnight understands that the WHO committee that reviewed the evidence for the use of face coverings in public didn't back them, but after political lobbying, 
political lobbying, the WHO now recommends them, unquote. And, and Deb Cohen actually said as well that she actually put that directly to the WHO at the time. Well, oh, have you flip-flopped, reverse ferreted because of political lobbying? And they didn't deny it. They didn't deny it. So very interesting if anybody's, anybody's uh, wishes to pursue that a bit further. Uh, the BMA continued calls for compulsory face mass in GP surgeries on the 8th of June. And of course, 15th of June, it all started, didn't it? Masks mandated on transport and soon in healthcare, and then within four to five weeks in shops and in schools. Okay, I'm trying to wind it down because I've probably waffled on too long, but the, the masking of the UK, you know, where does the responsibility lie? You know, why did we have to endure that from 2020 onwards? Now, I'd, I'd say a lot of people were culpable. You know, a lot of politicians, ministers, you know, Boris Johnson and other senior political figures, I think could rightly be accused of being weak, uh, at the very least, uh, and doing what seemed easy rather than what was right. And that's a phrase from Harry Potter, isn't it? <laughs> Shouldn't do what, don't do what's easy, do what's right. But I digress. But yeah, they, <laughs> uh, but there's, yeah, there's a lot of people implicated. Boris Johnson, other senior political figures, but there were some key players who were proactively pushing mass early doors. Dominic Cummins apparently was fixated on masks. He was obviously Boris Johnson's advisor. Uh, he was pushing Ancott to be more aggressive on the issue. That's according to the Pandemic Diaries, which is the Isabel Oakshot uh, publications. Uh, and apparently Cummins was demanding that masks be mandated in shops and for restaurant staff. Matt Hancock, Matt, don't kill your gran, Hancock, uh, kind of U-turned, uh, apparently to avoid a public spat with Nicola Sturgeon, going into the pandemic diaries and some of the messages that we're passing. Don't want an argument about masking, so we'll do it. Uh, and also, he was just so happy to enforce power, wasn't he? He was so happy to mandate them and uh, use the power of the state to get compliance in the form of hefty fines. The BMA and education unions, I think were very vocal as well. I've already mentioned the BMA. I was, I was pledged to leave off the behavioral scientists tonight, but I can't let David Halpin go uncriticized. Professor David Halpin, who's the head of the nudge unit, the behavioral insight team, uh, what he found this out during the COVID inquiry, actually, looking through the transcripts. But back in March, David Halpin was pushing for, for masks in the community. Um, according to his testimony to the COVID inquiry, he was struggling advocating back in March 220 for the imposition of face coverings, telling the, the government that they were wrong at that time not to be... Uh, uh, masking the general public and and later in June 2020 he became even more proactive he actually took upon himself or him and his behavioral insight team colleagues actually took it upon himself to get masks tested at Port and Down which is the military establishment so he took it upon himself to take various masks down to Port and Down to get them tested claimed they found that they were beneficial and then returned and started sending messages. It's all true, it's all in his statement, this. He's quite proud of it, actually. Sending statements to uh, Chris Whitty, Patrick Valance, Simon Case, who I think was the cabinet secretary at the time, saying, you must mask, you know, we must put, you know, impose masks on the British people. So he's culpable as well. And the Royal Society, I think, don't get off scot-free. Uh, and it sounds like I'm not alone in that, given Richard's grimacing at the front every time, every time I mention the name. Uh, you know, they produce their, they, you know, they hosted Dell, they produced their own pro mass paper as well. And that one really did kind of uh, 
uh, big up the psychological messages. The Royal Society paper was very much about, you know, this gives all the right messages uh, that we need for, during a pandemic. And on the 7th of July 2020, the president of the Royal Society told the Guardian newspaper, and I quote, refusing to wear a mask in public should become as socially unacceptable as drink driving or not wearing a seatbelt. So they were full on. So they, they all carry a certain amount of, of culpability. But delve are the, delve are the ones in my view, who were pivotal, because I don't think it would have happened without the endorsement of a body of academics, because they, tr they couldn't keep on trying forever, although <laughs> it was an extended period of trying to find some kind of uh, academic group to sanction it. Uh, the Delve group is quite interesting. Uh, if you actually look at some of the membership of Delve, uh, they do have a high-level steering group, which clearly has Patrick, or did have Patrick Valance's ear, because they talk about a direct communication with, with Patrick uh, Valance, the government scientific officer, chief scientific officer. Uh, and its membership of this steering group includes Devi Schreider, who I'm sure... Anybody, everybody heard of Devi Schreider, Professor <laughs> Devi Schreider? I think, I, I think she's, she's quite well known in these parts, I should imagine. Yeah, Professor of Global Health at Edinburgh University. Demi, Demi Hassabi, <laughs> who's an artificial intelligence expert, who if you look into his profile, his stated mission in life is to, and I quote, solve the problem of intelligence and then use <laughs> AI to solve everything else. And Daniel Kamen, who is one of the most famous behavioural scientists in the world, American from uh, Princeton University. So finally, conclusions. Reiterate, reiterate what I said earlier. To justify coercion in a civilised society, you should have evidence that is unequivocally in favour of the benefits that will accrue from the intervention that's mandated and should be also confident that it won't have significant uh, disadvantages. Mass mandates failed on, on, on both those counts. So if we were to sum up the main reasons why we were forced or pressured to wear masks during that time, I'd say this, that the main reasons included a weak government, weak ministers, weak politicians, a kind of uh, collectivist mindset that I think permeates academia and a lot of the health institutions. This kind of, some would, back in the day when left-wing politics and right-wing politics actually meant something, you might have viewed collectivism as being something that resided more comfortably in, with left-wing kind of thinking. But I think COVID event turned all that upside down in many ways. Uh, but this idea that we're all in it together, you know, for the greater good, do the social responsible thing, uh, that kind of collectivism that sounds at one level like a good thing, but when you start digging into it, I think is not so good. And of course, the support of the behavioural scientists. But if I ever have grandkids, and fingers crossed, I might be getting grandkids in the next few years. If I ever had grandkids, and many years from now, one of those grandchildren comes to me and says, Grandad, yeah, who masked the UK back in 2020? I'd say this. It was a shadowy multidisciplinary group called Delve, whose key figures included a media darling of the lockdown and jab them approach to pandemic management, a fervent advocate of transhumanism, and an American nudger. I'd say that. <laughs> and thank you. That's it.